Hello, I'm Ed Ludwig, speaking on behalf of the Doylestown Historical Society. And I'm here in Austin, Texas, with Herman Silverman, who in a few moments will be speaking to a man who said that when he was a paper boy, he knew every house in Doylestown, James Michener. And for historical purposes, uh, today is August 3, 1996, and uh, this filming is being done by the Austin Public Broadcasting Affiliate. Doylestown, its persons, places, and events. One of our society's objectives is to collect and preserve remembrances of our fascinating community. The first interview we filmed uh, was Herman Silverman on his 50-year friendship with Jim Michener. So today's interview, although it isn't a complete turnabout, has at least some elements of fair play. It's interesting, these two men, Jim Michener grew up in Doylestown and called it home for many years. And to a lot of people, it's the place where he's from. Herman Silverman went to college in Doylestown and stayed on. And with his wife, Anne, has <clears throat> made and continues to make huge contributions to the betterment of our area. So <clears throat> these two men, who became close friends, now personify the finest in the history of our town. And our society is delighted and uh, greatly honored to present this interview, James Michener, looking homeward to Doylestown. Jim, I meet a lot of people in town who know that I have connection with you, and they say to me, how's Jim? And so I'm gonna ask you, How's Jim? How you doing? I'm still reporting for work in the morning. <laughs> that's, that's good enough for me. I read the latest book that you wrote, Miracle in Seville. Was that the latest one? Yes. I was pretty good. I learned more about the bullfighting, and, I, and when I was here last time, I said to you, how did you remember? You hadn't been to Mexico for, what, 25 years? Maybe more? How do you remember all that stuff? And you said to me, Herman, as a writer, I have to remember it. Is that what you said? Yes, that's my job. You look at all the different books I've written, covering all the different subjects. I had to have a peculiar brain power, <laughs> which I started to exercise in the schools of uh, Doylestown. You said in, a, in, a, in, a, in an interview that as I look back, I'd say that 55% of my character was formed by what happened in Doylestown. Now, you were involved in Doylestown from 1907 to 1921. That was the years that you felt that uh, you were, you had the greatest, in, that the town had the greatest impact on you. Mm, How I would, so? I would still stand by that, Herman. How, what were, the, what, were the, what were the mechanics of that? What were the uh, incidents that you, would, you could uh, tell us about? Well, I lived with Mrs. Michener, who took in abandoned children. And we always had in our house uh, six or seven very lively children. So I was never the hotshot. There were others who were brighter and livelier, who could fight better. But I grew up in that yeasty period. Also, we were very poor. When I think of how my mother, my adopted mother, with no husband on the premises, was able to support us all, 
and send three of us through college. Boy, you're talking about a heroic woman. And that she was. You told me once that you lived in nine different houses in Doylestown. I know that uh, last summer, you, uh, two summers ago, when you visited the museum, you and I went around to these nine different houses, and I went home and got six different jackets so you could wear a different jacket at every, at every home, and we had pictures of those, and now they're at the museum showing all the different houses you lived in. And people think that's very curious. Tell us about that. <laughs> now, you were what? Uh, you were what? You were, you were 10, 10 years old? About she made that her time. living by taking and washing. And as a little boy, I went around to collect the washing. <laughs> Isn't that great? And then delivered when it was done. She made her living also by sewing on buttons on shirts that uh, were delivered to her in a big canvas bag from Philadelphia by a guy named Mr. Schneider. And she worked, I mean, she worked every hour of the day. And she did all the laundry for us. She washed our clothes and so that we were clean. What about her bookie, her books? You told me once that's because of the books that she brought in the house. What was that? Now, about? how she lived, what, that one part I put together that she was a field agent for Wynn James. And he would move her into one after another of his houses. And she would clean them up, get them in ready order, and increase their value to him. I lived in those years in nine different homes. And I can remember every one of them where the rooms were. Because some were better than others. <laughs> we'd, we'd strike it lucky. <laughs> and uh, it gave me a view of uh, existence that many people don't have and never gain. They have no respect for the poor. They believe they're all grifters and thieves and thugs. Well, that's philosophy. Well, among you? that group of no goods was my mother <laughs> and she did not fit those qualifications I remember a wintry period when we were moved into a house I'm not going to say on what street but I can see it today that was rife with bugs, including bed bugs. And she made us sit up all night, not get into any of the furniture, and in the morning demand another home. And then we got a home, I think, on Shule Avenue, which was a splendid street and later on Clinton Avenue, which was even better. Sometimes we regress to a couple of houses on North Main Street, weren't so hot. And you did live on Court Street. Matter of fact, you lived on two different houses on Court Street. Uh, the houses on East Court Street. Yeah. Because they put me right across from this divinely mad man, Henry Mercer, 
who had traveled in Europe and seen the castles along the Rhine. And he said, I want a castle in Doorstown. And that far from my home, he built his first castle. He brought over a bunch of very able steel uh, concrete workers, and he built a German castle on a bit of farmland in Doorstown. It was magnificent. When it was finished, it was near his birthday, and he celebrated by piling onto the top of his concrete castle, which was fireproof, a wealth of cedar trees and other things. He doused them with gasoline and at 11 o'clock at night he set the whole thing ablaze. <laughs> <laughs> we had flames reaching to heaven. And I remember my mother called me out to see it because from our room we were looking right into it. It was amazing to me that in all the years I lived in Doylestown at the eastern end, and I would pass Henry Mercer's castle every day. And on many days he would pass me. And in all that time, he never once spoke to me <laughs> or nodded to me. Well, he me. was upper class, Jim. He, he was He a, was a multi-millionaire at the time, wasn't he? He was a gentleman. Was he? And we were the you local... You were riffraff. We were the local peasants. You were the local peasants. You lived outside the most, And really. I, I think in all my life, I never spoke to Mercer. Certainly, he never spoke to me. <laughs> he came through the town those two big dogs, you know. And when he got to the traffic light, he went right on through, and the police were supposed to stop the traffic. And when he finished building his great castle on the east end of town, he built an even bigger, better one on the west end of town. And history played a curious trick. That in later years, I became a major contributor yes. to the second yeah. castle. <laughs> oh, yes, sure, of course. And the museum named after me is about that far. Across the street, yeah. From the Just across the So you're street. actually next to each other now, and he still doesn't speak to you. Of course, he's been dead now, so that's I impossible. Think, I doubt he would even speak to oh, me. Oh, no. If he were alive today. Now, oh, oh, he'd invite you away. You don't Jim. know her. Oh, yes, you You would. don't know Harry Jim, Russell. you once told me that your love of books came about because your mother happened to be in happened to buy, what was that all about, bought some books into the house? What, how did that come about? My mother read to us children every night, and she read the best. Charles Dickens, Thackeray, Charles Reed, and a book by a Polish writer named Sienkiewicz. We had a Sienkiewicz living in town, no relative, yeah. I guess. Who uh, wrote Quo Vadis. Oh, boy. A fantastically yes, sir. successful book. And later on, I would write a 
major book about Poland. He was Polish. I was an honorary Pole. You were, are you kidding? You were, you were honored by the Pope and everyone else at the time in Poland. I saw some tapes of that visit you made there. I had a very curious relationship with the Pope. And I was making a television show in Poland, which was then under Russian domination. And there was a fighting cardinal who was in jail most of the time in Warsaw. named Vyshinsky. I had long talks with him, and he advised me to go down to Krakow, where there was an entirely different kind of cardinal, and that Vyshinsky fought the, uh, fought the Russian communists every inch of the way, Wojtyla in the south figured the thing to do was to cotton to them, take them into his arms, and by gosh he did. And he turned out to be the uh, new pope to, to the amazement of the whole world. Yeah. And he turned out to be a fighting man. Jim, there's a... Uh... I have mixed feelings about Pope John Paul II. Jim, right now there's an argument going on about which book came first. I would like to change the subject because I'd like to cover the fact that the Fires of Spring was written, was published soon after the South Pacific. And there's a kind of an argument that Fires of Spring was the first book that you wrote. Oh, no. It was not. No way. Okay. So, so now well, we know that. That is the kind of book that uh, young men write first. But I wrote mine second. It was second. Definitely. And, and you know that you know the uh, the amount of interest it caused. Everybody thought it was autobiographical. That it was part of your life. Yeah. And that you that, that many people in it uh, mirrored some of the some of the people that you knew. And we just wondered. Uh, uh, you had a Judge Harmon, H A R M O N, Judge Harmon Yerkes, in your book, would you remember whether he was part of anybody that you recognized? Was that that's he the, was real? He was real, and he was the uh, local agent for the uh, PRT. The PRT, which ran the Pennsylvania Rapid Transit, which ran the, uh, the trolley car. Trolley car from what east and down to Willow Grove. From Easton to Doylestown to Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And he got to be a job with the PRT. And it was a pretty lively affair. <laughs> How about when James Sr.? Now, you had mentioned him before. He was a, a real estate man, but we knew his son also, didn't we? Uh, but you knew it when James Sr. He was the one that, that worked with your mother. That you had when James Sr. was a six foot seven lanky real estate man who was a uh, very vocative fellow in a community that was totally Republican. His son, a little older than I, 
looked just like him. That was the one we knew. Yeah, that was the, the one. When we went to all his weddings? I think he was married seven times. Yeah. <laughs> the last one occasion, enormous comment. Because as you remember, we arranged for a great celebration at the local bistro. And at the last minute, his bride-to-be decided that she didn't want any part of this. Too much, and she walked out. And young Wynn came to the party anyway, And he said, I've lost my bride, but I haven't lost my delight in a good time. So let's go on with the celebration. <laughs> I remember we were there. Yeah. You, and Mar you and Mari and Annie and I went there to that. Who was Monica Paxson? She was part of that Fires of Spring also. Who? Monica Paxson, do you know that? Mar Marcia, I'm sorry, Marcia Pax, or Mona? Purely made up. She was made up? Yeah. Okay, tell us how, uh, the account of uh, the poorhouse, and you're, you're, you're uh, living there for, for some time, some periods, how uh, faithful is that in the book to your experience in the poorhouse? I didn't understand the question. Well, you once told me that your experience of living in the poorhouse Oh, poor house! I was at courthouse. No, poor house, and that, and that, the, seeing these guys who were down oh, on their no, luck. No, no, From time to time, my mother would fall upon real tough streets, and she would deposit us in the courthouse, in the poor house, where my aunt Hannah was. Uh, working. And I lived on the second floor of a huge dormitory filled with old men who had lost their way. And in those days, Herman, it was common when a man or a woman but I lived only with the men, lost his way and lost his forward movement for neighbors to put together all his goods in a wagon drawn by horses and drive them down 611 and about three miles out of town turn right and go up a lane of trees and deposit the old man there with a small parcel of his worldly goods. I saw these men And on several occasions when I was already in high school, I became great friends with some of them. They had been good citizens. They had paid their taxes. They had helped raise their families. And their lives had ended in that lane of trees leading into the poorhouse. 
I guess that made a bit of pressure on you, didn't it? Oh, a terrible impression. Yeah. You decide you're never going to get Especially poor. a man I called old Daniel, who was the soul of the earth and who looked after me. While I was in the poorhouse, And he kept telling me, James, don't ever end this way. Protect yourself. If you get a job, save your money. And if you're bright and attentive, you can do it. So I have a different attitude toward money from anyone you know. Because when I, when I was collecting laundry for my wealth and helping with the sewing, I lived a strange life because we had nothing. I never had any roller skates. I never had a baseball glove. I did have some worn out tennis shoes. I never had a wagon. I had nothing. And this so infuriated me that I developed the idea of to hell with money. I'm never going to have any, but I'm certainly not going to let it dominate me. You gave it all away, Jim. The word is out that you gave over $100 million away to some Ultimately, I hope you got a few bucks left to pay. I the gave away fee around here. More than a hundred million dollars. Yeah. Because I looked into a writing career for which I had a real affinity. Well, I will agree that when we go out to have dinner, Mari and you and Annie and I, we'd always try to find the, the best dinner we could get for the least amount of money. And we were pretty successful, I think, weren't we? I lived that way all my life. <laughs> we were successful. Jim, when you were working at the uh, Willow Grove Park, uh, before that, I'm, I'd like to ask you some questions about you know, the early days when you were at school. Uh, people come up to me and say, oh, Jim went to school with my grandfather, and Jim went to school with this person, and oh, we know that person. And we had a Margaret Cooper. Do you remember Margaret Cooper? I do indeed. And a Harry She was Fink. a little older than me, but... She came from a very distinguished family. Did she, at that time? And how about Harry Big Bigby? Remember him at all? Splendid young man. He was, he was pure gold. How about that basketball coach, Alan Gardy? He was something, wasn't he? He, he was a figure. Were you <laughs> around when they had, when he owned the land that they had, the estate that they had, the Doylestown Fair? Off Court Street? Oh, yes. I knew the doors and fair. And because it was right beyond where we lived. That's right, right behind it, right behind it was those a house. Nice field. That's right. Guardy owned that land. Did he? I didn't yes, know that. When I, was at, when I was at farm school, I used to go up there in 1937, 38. But that more, was, more power to but, him. But was that not something? And he was a big basketball coach of yours, was he? He was uh, my coach. He was? He was? He was a splendid man. He owned a print shop in town. Yes, Bill Wolf. Does that name mean anything to you? Mm -hmm. Bill Wolf. And another fellow by the name of Bathless Ritter, who later became Ritter Finance. Oh, yes. Bill Wolf. That's a familiar name, but I don't remember who. Uh -huh. How about this boy's brigade? It had, a, it had a social center on Donaldson Street. That was pretty <clears throat> important to a lot of people in town. A hey, uh, roofer 
without a nickel, somehow managed to uh, get control of a uh, basketball court. George Murray. George Murray. Was that in the high school? Jim, was it? Grammar school. Grammar school. And he was one of God's right-hand agents. He was that important to you? Oh, he was everything for us. Kids like me, because he had this basketball court. How old were you at the time, Jim? 10, 11, 12? I must have been a member of his brigade for six or eight years. Uh -huh. And uh, his influence was paramount. He was a saintly man. Spent every nickel he had on boys. Does the name Krauthammel ring a bell with you? First name at Krauthammel. Don't remember. In some of the stuff I read about your early youth, uh, you talked about the hitchhiking that you used to do across the country. I did that with Ted Johnson. He was a year older than I. Ted Johnson, the fellow we later knew who but married like, to the woman who, who did the framing. In but like me, he was... Uh, He didn't know who his parents were. So we sort of formed a friendship. Very strange. I was going to be the brightest boy in high school. And Ted was going to be lame brain and yet we formed a partnership that took us to hitchhiking trips into New York on to Boston on the main and in the other direction down to Florida. What did you do for money, Jim? We were daring beyond imagination. Time and again I would set out from Doylestown with 35 cents in my pocket <laughs> and go as far as Chicago. They were easy days then. It was the beginning of the automobile. About 1900, the early 1900s? Yeah, the 19... I was born in 07. I was about 14 years. The early 1921. Mm -hmm. The beginning. And there were no creeps on the road then. No sexual deviates preying on young men, young, young boys. And I lived a remarkable career, including later actually hoboing 
by uh, jumping freight cars. Did you get to meet the hobos? And actually hobos on the freight yards in the... Uh, oh, yes. Along the lines? I would sometimes live in their camps. Really? They would look after me. Jimmy, you ran for Congress at one time, didn't you? Why did you decide to run for Congress? I have always loved politics. And I ran for office five times. And every time the job had a salary, the other man won, because he needed that money. Every time it was honorary, I won real big. Nobody wanted it but you. Uh, nobody and, uh, the money. Is that? I think that. You said that you lost, you lost the election of, of the uh, congressman from our district because the woman in Bristol got 300 feet of sewer pipe. We had a close election. And in the south end of our county, there was a fabulous woman named, what was her name? At any rate, she was a Democratic boss. And we made a deal with her that we would give her so much money and so much and a rented car and other prerogatives if she would vote for me. And get the vote out. And she gave a uh, gala affair in Bristol with uh, most of the Democrats in uh, formal dress, including me. And she gave a speech about the fact that I was exactly the kind of uh, man who ought to be running for office and whom they ought to support. So I figured that end of the county was safe because we'd agree to all her demands. <clears throat> Come election night, That part of the county voted about 600 for the Republicans, <laughs> 30 for the Democrats. 30 for you. Huh? 30 for me. And when I raised the devil about it, because we had wasted good money on her, The local expert said, Jim, at the last minute, those dirty Republicans moved in and promised her everything that you did, but threw in also 600 feet. 600 feet of sure. used sure sewer pipe. pipe. <laughs> I was the guy who went down the sewer. <laughs> you got it, didn't you? Early on in your in your life, when you had asked me to find land for you to build your home, and we found that piece of piece of wonderful property called High Rock. Yes. You remember when I. I called you wherever you were and told you about it, and your initial reaction was, my God, kids are going to get killed climbing up and down the high rocks. And uh, you gave it away. To, you gave it to the park recreation. I gave it to the government. To the government. 
How did you know that land so well, Jim? Because you were right. People have been kids have been climbing it now for years. Herman, I knew everywhere. You knew that piece of property so well up there in Tinnicum? I I'd known it for many years. It was a choice piece of property. I remember we paid three thousand dollars for it. It sure was a choice, <laughs> choice piece of yeah. property. But uh, you gave that away, and I yeah. often wonder how you knew because you weren't even there to to, to look at it when it when we purchased it, and you gave it away. Jim, did you write any books before that were turned down? People often say, "What books did Jim write that didn't get published before before South Pacific and before Fires of Spring?" Did you write many things that were turned down? I started three important books, which I did not finish. You mean before before South Pacific, or be, or after that? Before and after. Before and after. And uh, I always explained it by saying I had lost forward motion and that was about the case I would discover that I wasn't as good as I thought I was that this was a bigger chunk of beefsteak than I could chew so actually you had written some books before South Pacific that, that that never hit. In other words, a lot of people think you hit on the first book that you wrote, which was South Pacific, and became the big hit. But you did write one. I wrote one novel before South Pacific. Before South Pacific. And I've lost it. I don't know where it is. Now, do you have any reflections? People also come up to me and t tell me about the time of the Union Horse Company for detection and apprehension of horse thieves that they had to us. And I think they, you, were the, they, you were one of the honored guests there. The Union Horse Company was a frolic of uh, the middle class yahoos. Yahoos. <laughs> in uh, Doylestown. And every year they had a mock hanging of the newest horse thief. And one year they chose me. That was a jolly occasion. 